symptoms and it can be hard to know what to do or what not to do. So this is our Canvas site. And um, you'll see this is our homepage. And if you scroll down, I have this lovely welcome message that is largely not relevant now that you have all been welcomed, but you can access any of the weekly modules here that we're working on, as well as the Zoom classroom link. And down here is contact information for me and for Alyssa. You can also look over at the to-do list on the right. And if you've done it already, you can just check it off, say, I don't wanna worry about that anymore. I have done these things. I don't want them on my list. Um, and you can keep going. You, if, if it's today, you've done all the things, okay? Um, but here is, let me go to um, week two. I recommend that you go through all the pages um, and that way you don't miss anything. Me talking to you through Canvas is like me having class with you. In fact, there's so much of that that that's one of the reasons why we don't meet on Fridays is there is asynchronous material. And so here's the introduction. Here's what we want to accomplish under objectives. And here is everything that we're going to do for that week. And if you just turn the pages, you will do all the things. Um, you can just click on next. And again, some more um, information, um, asynchronous instruction. And then next, um, somebody asked if I could post the slide decks, because um, that would be useful. And so you can, and if you down, want to download it, as a Google Doc, so you can take notes on it while we're talking, you can do that. Um, but go through them all, because then you won't miss anything. You won't miss any assignments. You won't miss any instruction. Um, that's all I want to say about that. Does anybody have any questions for me about the Canvas site? Before we move on to our course content for today, you can just unmute yourself and ask. Okay, I'm going to stop share. And um, I know it's, I know it's really weird um, to be using both Blackboard and Canvas. And I don't want this to be confusing for you. Or Okay, so it is gonna be confusing. I don't think there's a way out of that, but let me make it as easy as possible. I guess that's the best I can say. So you can see that I'm saying this phrase over and over again, raise your voice. And um, my, mom, my mom used to say that to me, she goes, um, she, Kathy, she called me Kathy, and that's a long story, but I don't have time for it now, but she'd say, Kathy, young lady, don't raise your voice with me, and apparently I was yelling at her, and yelling is not what I mean. Um, so what do I mean when I'm using this phrase, raise your voice? Um, anybody, you can just um, unmute yourself and maybe explain what you think that I mean. Maybe like speaking So I think they made more sense. Let's see, we're having a hard time understanding you. Um, um, I think what you said is just say something. Um, can somebody add to that? I know Litzy said good things, but I couldn't hear it. Comes, it's coming through a little bit garbled. Um, somebody else, what do we mean when we say, what do I mean, I guess? What do I mean when I say raise your voice? I think by raising your voice, you mean standing up for something you believe in um, and something that isn't really acceptable in society, but you still say it 
because you want a change to happen in the world? Yeah, that's definitely part of it. Um, <clears throat> when we raise our voice, we might raise our voice um, as activists because we want to change something. Um, what are some other ways that, what are some other ways I might mean raise your voice? Um, so I would say, say like, maybe like about standing up against the crowd and, and um, basically standing out for something that you may be passionate about or not just something you necessarily believe, but something that might be different than everybody else's. So it stands out. And so you kind of have to um, make unique out of it in a sense. By raising your voice, um, you're going against the status quo in some sense. Yeah, to speak up against the status quo. Somebody else um, unmuted. Come on back in and, and share what you're thinking. Then I will just say that. Share what you're thinking. Um, a lot of times when we want to say something, we want to challenge the status quo because our perspective tells us something different. Um, we might want to be activists or as Itzy said, you know, like we need to speak, we need to say something. We have something to add to a conversation, some clarification, um, a personal experience, um, a different perspective that, you know, like it might go against the status quo, it might challenge the status quo, or it might just add a different perspective that helps people understand something different. Um, I think I'd like to, um, I'm gonna put you in breakout groups, and I'd like for you to um, introduce each other, obviously, and where you are, um, in class today, it might be your dorm, it might be your dining room table. I'm pretending I'm at Lake Skinner, which is up near Temecula. Um, so where you are, your name, and then I want you to think of um, situations where you might raise your voice. Um, and I want you to talk about possibilities does raising our voice always include words? And give me some examples of possibilities where raising our voice does not include words. So um, let me put you into groups. And there are 29 of us. So I'm gonna put us into eight groups. And there we go. Take note of what group you're in. So, um, people are still popping in. Is everybody here? Yes. Um, so group six, tell me some situations where it might be important to raise your voice. Uh, we talked about how, like, with everything going on, your individual voice is oftentimes kind of lost, but your actions of, like, still being in or like at a protest still matters so that like 
you're still being a part of something and you're still speaking out even if you're not actually physically speaking now yeah and that's not necessarily using words it's it's your body and the collection of bodies to speak out on something that matters to you um if it's just one person i i, I it's less effective than if it's 20 people or 50 people or hundreds of people. Um, group seven, other ways that you can speak out um, situations. Anybody from group seven? <laughs> um, we kind of talked about how you, um, other nonverbal ways that you can kind of stand up for what you believe in are like making art or music to kind of share like your view or idea on how things should be? Yeah, I just saw an episode. I tried to see if I could get a clip from it. It was W. Kamau Bell's United We Fall. And he was, um, he interviewed an Iranian artist who studied in the United States and was presenting in the United States. And she has this extraordinary artwork, but it's very subversive. And she said, I, I want it to be beautiful, but I want it to say something, but I don't want it to say it so loudly that um, if somebody said, Did, are you saying this? She can say, oh no, that's not what I meant, depending on the situation. And so, yeah, Lily, that's, um, that's a really good point. Um, I should have remembered her name so that I could um, pull up some artwork that she had done. Um, we'll look at some artwork um, later on that where people are raising their voice. Can you think of situations that it's important to raise your voice? Um, group two. Um, we talked a lot about like um, the protest too. So speaking up against things like social issues um, that you find important is even in small situations or in big situations. So speaking up against maybe one person that says something offensive or a system that's offensive, maybe. Um, can you think of any musical artists who use their voices to speak up, to make a strong point? Childish Gambino. Yes, definitely. Um, he does that a lot in his music and his music videos. Um, somebody else? Alicia Keys. Um, can you think of a specific song, Eric? Not really at the moment, but I know she's very vocal. Yeah. Logic. Okay, this is a group I don't know. Um, tell, me, tell me about Logic. I don't know who was speaking. Oh, um, well, it, he did a song about like suicide. It was, um, it was called like 1-800-something. It was like the suicide hotline. Um, it was good. Yeah. I, you'll notice I'm looking down. It's, I'm taking notes. Um, I, I, quite frankly, if I don't watch Saturday Night Live and I don't teach, I lose all sense of popular culture. So yeah, there we go. Um, Let's um, get back to the PowerPoint because we've got a lot to cover, but I wanted you to, it doesn't do any good to show it if I don't share it. So now I have to do the share screen again. Move my face from current slide. There we go. Um, sorry about that. This is our plan for today. Um, I want to discuss elements of rhetoric because rhetoric really is about speaking up in a way that puts forth a message that responds to something that's going on in a local sense or a broader sense, but it responds to something that's going on and it puts forth, it allows the author or the speaker or the musician or the artist to raise their voices and speak to that. Um, I also want to review um, the values and Alton's American values and assumptions and talk about that a little bit. And then I want to introduce the next text. 
which um, I hope you will have read before next Wednesday. So um, as, I, as I walk into this, I just want to say that when I'm talking in a classroom face to face, I am watching every single student's face. And I'm responding to what you say. If you look bored, I'm going to do something and say something silly um, to catch attention. And so it's really weird when I'm just talking to my computer screen because I can't see your faces. And if I put too many faces on my screen, then I can't see the PowerPoint and I forget what I'm gonna talk about. And so, yeah, this is weird for me and I know it's weird for you too. It's just what we've got. And so I'm doing my best. So to counter this at periodic times in the lecture, um, I'm going to either stop the share and ask a question, or I'm just going to pause and I'm going to say, um, are, does anybody have any questions? Is there something you'd like clarification on? Or is there some application that you have to the world today? And so that's, I'll, I will get better at this, I'm sure, but right now this is, this is my plan, okay? So here we go. Um, rhetoric is the art of communication, communication, of raising our voice, the ability to determine out of all the possible ways to raise our voices, what is going to be the absolute best for a particular audience. And I think that that's important because um, if we want to raise our voices effectively, if we want audiences to listen to us, we have to find the best way. We want to find the ways to move the souls of our audiences in a way that, you know, like, they might not be able to justify logically, but they can feel it, that they know it. Um, Burke goes darker on this. And I think it's worth talking about because Burke observes that the most characteristic concern of rhetoric is the manipulation of beliefs for political ends. And I think that we see that a lot in political rhetoric. Um, but I don't think it needs to be manipulation. Um, it can be, and I think that we have to acknowledge that. But it can be, um, it can challenge the way people think in a non-manipulative way. Reed talks about what it is to write rhetorically, since she's focused on writing. And she says, when we write about what we care about, um, something we're passionate about, that we know about, when we show and don't just tell, when we pay more attention to our needs as authors and our audience's needs, then we're writing rhetorically that we will be able to determine the available means of persuasion, that we will be able to move the souls of our authors or our audiences. And, and I think that read more than, well, Aristotle, Weaver, Burke, they are all focused on rhetoric isn't you know, like this abstract thing that, is done in a vacuum. We don't raise our voice in a vacuum. We raise our voice so somebody else can hear it, so we can make a difference, so we can challenge the way people think, encourage them to see the world in a new way. And we have to think about an audience. We don't just speak up if there is no audience. Some of you in your um, in your reflection and direction questions, you observe that you are constantly thinking about when do I want to speak up? And I forget who it is that said this, but some of them said, you know, like if I know the audience isn't gonna listen anyways, it's just not worth saying it. Um, I wanna think about time, place, and I will be most likely to speak up if I care more 
or if it's somebody else's safety or respect is at risk. It is about connecting with an audience. Um, I know the next slide is about underlying assumptions, and I want to come back to that concept in a minute. But let me go on to these words, these Greek words that you're familiar with. Um, somebody, you know, like what have you, what do you know about ethos? Just mute yourself. Um, and ethos, uh, from what I know, ethos is an appeal to authority. It um, can be an appeal to authority. When you appeal to authority, Eric, um, what's happening? Um, you sort of like appeal to a pre-established um, sort of uh, situation. Like, like, um, like if I was making an argument to someone and I was arguing about something that they that wasn't very relevant to their lives, I would connect it to something that was like more relevant to like what controls their lives, basically. And how does that help you as a speaker? That um, that makes it so that it can it convinces the uh, my audience that I um, understand where they're coming from. Does I, I don't know if that makes sense. Like um, like like I understand their situation and what like is sort of going on in their world. Yeah, I think that's a pretty good observation, Eric. That appeal to authority um, shows that you understand them and it makes you seem more credible. In fact, if we are gonna to appeal to authority, we're gonna add some evidence, we're showing that we're knowledgeable, we show that we understand, um, and ethos, that appeal to authority is part of ethos. And the essence of ethos is this, to show that you, the speaker or the writer, can be trusted, that you are credible. Aristotle um, observed that there are five ways that an, a speaker can build that ethos or that trustworthiness or that credibility. And one is knowledgeability. And that's why appealing to authority says, hey, I didn't, this isn't my idea, but this expert over here, this authority over here also says it. And therefore I must be credible. My concept, my claim must be trustworthy because the, tr the expert, the authority is saying it also. Um, and it also, if you share an example, um, you're showing, oh my gosh, yes, I totally understand how you feel, or I've experienced that too. Honestly, that's why Reed starts out her article with that phrase, writing is hard, because she knows her audience already thinks that. And by acknowledging what they already think, that underlying assumption that she's assuming that they think that, she shows, yes, I'm like you. Um, concern for the audience is another way to build ethos. Seeming fair or objective or good are other ways to build ethos, to show that you, the speaker, the one raising your voice, or write, you, the writer, the one raising your voice, you can be trusted. And establishing ethos is super important for any argument. Um, why? Anybody? Because if your audience doesn't trust what you're saying, they're not really going to care. They're just going to ignore you or not absorb anything. Yeah, absolutely, Chris. Um, so I think establishing ethos is super important. And you will see most writers do that early on. Um, we would note that Reed doesn't only do that in the very first sentence. She is, a, she is demonstrating 
her concern for the audience, for their success. She's sharing her own experiences that are often those that are same of her audience. Um, she's demonstrating her knowledgeability. Um, from beginning that very first sentence all the way to the end. And I think that that's super, super important to note is that ethos construction isn't a one-time deal. Um, so you would see those appeals to authority that Eric mentioned um, periodically and shared values, shared experiences from beginning to end. Um, an author doesn't have to do all of these things in order to establish ethos. But honest, if, if just as Chris said, if somebody doesn't trust you, you can raise your voice all you want and all what you're gonna do is end up annoying people, so. Um, pathos is a, another huge part of, um, of rhetoric, of being able to persuade somebody. What is pathos? Um, Melissa, what is pathos? Pathos is really anything that has to do with emotion. How people, well, it kind of says right there, but how people, how the audience feels um, as they read what you write. Yeah, good point. Um, it's, it's, where the author or the speaker gets the audience to feel an emotion. And you want to think about a whole range of emotions. Um, what were some, I mean, like some people may think anger um, or fear, um, but, or sadness. And those are, those are deep, deep emotions. But you probably didn't feel anger, fear, or sadness reading um, e. Shelley reads 10 Ways to Think About Writing, um, but you probably did feel some emotions. Think of more subtle emotions. What are some emotions that you might have felt while you were reading? Anybody? Um, uh, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. No, you um, go. Okay, thank you. <laughs> um, I was just going to say that I think I felt um, a sense of relief reading it because she was relating to the audience, aka me. So I felt like, okay, like if I do struggle with writing, I know I'm not the only one. And she gets that. Yeah, and so you felt understood, which feeling understood yeah. is an emotion, um, but relief is an emotion. Um, any other emotions that anybody felt? Eric? Um, just momentary, like, confusion, like, or if I didn't understand one thing after reading it the first time and then I had to read over a sentence, just, like, momentarily, like, feeling a little, like, lost, but, like, that's probably not her, uh, you know, like, goal. I, that was not her goal, but actually confusion is an emotion that somebody might feel, and an author might choose to evoke emotion. Um, what are some ways that authors might, or speakers might evoke emotions? Um, Laika. Sorry, what was the question again? That what are some ways that an author might evoke emotions? What might an author or a speaker or an artist do to make an audience feel emotions? Maybe like using their like own like personal experience and like creating it into like words to like create that meaning. Yeah, telling a story is a really powerful way. Um, Jenny, what's another way? Um, maybe by um, including things that people wouldn't want to hear or see. Yeah. Um, so adding details that might shock or disturb people, um, that could evoke emotions of anger or disgust or um, just feeling disturbed or concerned. 
um, suspicious. Um, again, we're naming a lot of emotions. And if you're ever thinking about pathos, you definitely want to think about what emotion are you feeling as an audience or what, what emotion is the author trying to evoke and why? And I like the way Alexis described, um, you know, like, I felt relief because the audience, AKA me, feels this way and other people do too. And therefore it's okay to feel this way. And so she had that whole process of how does Reed get her to feel that way? And how does it get Reed's argument that writing will always be hard, but there are some ways to approach it that can at least get you to raise your voice effectively? And so Alexis walked us through that process. Um, Alexis, great job illustrating a point that I wanted to make. So without even knowing. Thank you. Um, thank you. So um, logos is not the same as evidence. So what is logos? Anybody? Hi, um, Logos is kind of using like logic and maybe just like data and statistics and just kind of just like the raw details of it to support your argument or whatever you're talking about. So raw details, data, statistics is super useful. Think about, um, think about E. Shelley Reed's fruit jello and arguments because I think that that speaks to what Logos is. So if we just, throw in a lot of cherries and throw them on the table and they all roll off, we're going, why are those there at the potluck? But if there's some jello, the cherries would be the data, sorry. I'm so glad you guys have all read this because honestly, it will make it easier. Yeah, it's, it's the analysis of the data combined with the data that make logos. So logos is, as Cameron said, it's the logic or the reasoning that make the argument seem true. And so the best logos is logic or reasoning combined with data, but sometimes you might see, you might see logos without any data statistics um, in order to make the argument seem true. I know that, um, Alton adds, I don't think I noticed any data in there. He's got a lot of hypothetical situations. Um, and yet he's relying a lot on logos. He's got the hypothetical situation with some analysis. And um, yeah, there he goes. So that's ethos, pathos, and logos. Um, I want to stop the share just briefly and questions, observations. Um, I know some of you, I may have complicated some things that you learned in high school. Um, so ask me. Okay, so apparently I didn't confuse you as much as I thought I might have. So let me come back. Um, really quickly, um, I want to, um, I want to just, oh, I did it again. I will, I will be so good at share screen in the future, um, the future that is not today. Yeah, I wanted to pull this up. Um, I think you all are seeing um, the Mentimeter um, screen that we did last week. Um, I want you to notice that some of the words that we talked about um, that you used are actually on this screen. We see individualism, we see equality, we see democracy. 
um, these are words, ha um, capitalism, which is a lot like uh, materialism, ambition, which is that progress, um, opportunity. We see these words, justice, we see these words, and we saw them repeated in Alton's article. Um, I want to show you a new um, Mentimeter screen and let's do another survey. Um, a so I've got, I've got this font is really, really small. I wish I could have made it bigger. Um, go to menti.com and use the code 3037. Five nine six. Menti.com and the code is three zero three seven five nine six. And so I want um, often named nine different values. I want you to think about in your time in the United States. For some of you, that's an entire lifetime. For some of you, it, it's less than an entire lifetime. Which of the values have you observed in America? It's 3037596. And you can click on as many of these as you want. Um, but just um, three zero three seven five nine six. Which of them have you seen? It's only letting me click on one. I don't know. If oh, that's... really? Yeah. Is that yeah. true of the rest of you also? Yeah. 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 Wow. Well, yeah. that that really messes everything up right now. Because, um, of course, you're going to go left to right. I, sh I didn't understand that. I thought I would get, uh, well, then let's, let's go to the next screen. Um, are you able to advance to the next screen? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, excellent. So this one, it'd be a single thing. Which of Alton's values do you most see in your own life? Wow, I wouldn't have expected competition to be the one that was greatest. I actually thought again that you would be able to um, that you would be able to enter more than one. I'm still learning how to do this. You are, are the only group I've done a menti.com um, survey with it previously. Um, so that's really interesting. Um, let's go to the next screen. And this is a word cloud, and you'll be able to enter three, I believe. What are your most important values? And these can be not from often.
Again, I feel like I should have music playing while I do this. I wonder if that's an option. How does this compare to Alfen's list and why, what is similar to it and what is different? Anybody? Um, I'm seeing ones up here that, uh, uh, that Alfen um, were one of the, um, were one of the ones, one of the choices we got to pick but not one of the more popularly picked ones that we observe. Yeah. Somebody else. How is it similar? How is it different? I think there's some on here that I find interesting. Um, like things like family um, kind of go against some of the ideas that she pres that were presented. Um, because that's more of a community-based idea and less individualistic goal. And then there's some that are clearly more individual-oriented. And there's even the ones like competition, which was um, one of our exact examples. So there's kind of yeah. both. It's kind of a mix. Good. Thank you, Eliza. The slides that I skimmed over um, on underlying assumptions um, I want to return to that idea very briefly. We have like three minutes left. Underlying assumptions are the beliefs, the values, the ideas, the worldview that an audience has even before they listen to a speech, even before they read something. And if an author or a speaker wants to build that ethos, that credibility, if the author or the speaker wants to seem logical, wants to evoke emotions, they have to appeal to a specific audience. They have to, as E. Shelley Reed said, they have to adapt to audience and purpose, which is super important that an author be aware of the values that the audience holds. This is true in writing. This is true when we want to raise our voice. The next reading that I'm going to ask you to do is Bronson Koenig's What I Found at Standing Rock. It was um, written in, it was published in um, Player Tribune, which is an, a magazine that caters to sports fans. Bronson Koenig at the time was um, up for the draft, the NBA draft. I think he got drafted by uh, not a major league, uh, not a, the NBA, but another um, basketball league. And in what he found, um, what I found at Standing Rock, he's writing to a very specific audience and he has to appeal to their values in order to connect to them. And as, I, as you read, I want you to think about what values is he appealing to? They might be values here, but it's very likely that he's going to appeal to some of Alfen's values, are also the values that Alfen names. Um, I want to touch on Alfen um, briefly on Wednesday because I think the not all of us ascribe to the values often names and I want to think about that but right now it's 150 and I want to let you go because well because it's 150 and we're done and I have so many other things I want to talk about but it's not like I'm not going to see you again so um, I will end the session you can log out but if anybody would like to um, ask me a few questions afterwards, I will just stay on here briefly and 
answer questions. So have a great rest of your week and I'll see you again on Wednesday. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Thank you. Oh, I had a question about yeah, the like text. Um, where can I find it? Because I was like trying to find it and I couldn't really find it. Oh, you couldn't find Allison's article? Oh, no. Because um, don't we need like a textbook for this class, like the course reader? You do. Um, this, uh, <laughs> it's green. So it doesn't show up because I have a green screen. Let me take off my green screen. All right, um, choose virtual background, none. Okay, uh, now you can see it. So this is the book, it's an RWS 200 course reader. My guess is that there aren't any in the bookstore. Um, it's available electronic, um, an e-version, as well as um, a hard copy. And I imagine that you're going to have to order it from um, the Aztec bookstore the, um, on campus. Are you living on campus right now, Laika? Uh, no, I'm living at home. Well, they will ship it to you. So let me give you the ISBN number. Um, I'll just type it in the chat because that might be easier. My dog trying to um, ISBN 10. One seven two six nine two six nine zero five zero three four, and um, it's titled um, RWS two hundred course reader, and there's probably a bunch of them, but this one will have an editor of Llewellyn. Oh, I should hit enter. Uh, oh, this is just a hobby, which is weird. Okay, there. Now you've got it. I was, yeah, long day. Okay, I got it. Um, you, can, you can call them. Normally they run out of these books so quickly, like if we were on a face-to-face -face campus and, and students have to go to the desk and order it, but you can just call them and they will place that order for you. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks, Laika. Any other questions? Bye. All right. Oh, no, Bye. Awesome. Bye.